One of the features of London, as you'll have seen from that little insert on, on the flyer that you all got, is that London really is a city in motion. 24 million journeys every day. Uh, when we talk about um, you know, passenger trips on buses, uh, we number them in billions rather than in hundreds of thousands. Um, but that's not the whole of the story because actually, despite you know, the temporary effect of recession, um, London's a growing city. It's growing from migration both from the rest of the UK uh, as well as from elsewhere in the world. Um, Ken Livingston, I remember, used a very vivid but, but sort of, I think, rather uh, good uh, analogy. He said, we're going to see a city the size of Leeds uh, uh, arriving here by about 2025 and, and nothing that we've heard since uh, actually indicates that that isn't going to happen. It sort of gives you an idea of the, of the scale. And, and one of the issues that clearly, um, in a sense, uh, evolves from that is how are people going to get around the city? How is everybody going to be able to do what they want to do uh, in the best way that's possible for them? Um, affordable workspace is enormously hard to find because essentially the market is there, whether you like it or not, or believe it or not, you really don't have to, it's there anyway. And that market dictates, of course, the £80 a square foot in parts of London and elsewhere, uh, perhaps down as low as four. Um, one thing has happened in the last 15 to 20 years, but at an accelerating pace, which may just give us uh, a tool we can use that's never been available before. Because ever since the Romans pushed the first cart up Watling Street, there has been an umbilical link between economic growth and the growth of traffic. Whether that was the growth of individual mobility, the growth of freight traffic, uh, the growth in goods and services and people has always um, followed economic growth itself and put enormous pressures on infrastructure. But we're now in a world which can allow us, in a sense, to redefine distance uh, in a different way. Because uh, every one of you in an audience like this will have in your pocket or your purse uh, the kind of technology that allows you to communicate anywhere in the world, probably allows you to read all the emails you need, um, maybe even download the attachments. The important thing is that that combined with your laptop, combined with your, um, your ability to use everything from Skype to uh, the sort of latest developments in 4G, all simply do mean the death of distance as we know it. And that opens up enormous possibilities. Some of those possibilities around technology have, of course, been with us for a long time, and they've proved to be um, some of the great ideas that simply never happened. My favourites are always uh, the paperless office. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Me too. Um, the second is hot desking, which actually people hate. They quite like having something around them that actually says to them, this is my place, uh, and if possible, this is a place I can actually sort of relate to. The third, of course, and the one I suspect that um, arose most prominently over the last 10 years, is homeworking. Um, I mean, it's worth remembering that house arrest is a criminal sanction in most parts of the world. You know, people don't actually want to necessarily work at home all the time. The Dutch, I know, did a transport study that actually showed that home workers make more trips than commuters. Out of sheer boredom, I mean, out of a desire not to actually kill your children. You know, I mean, this, this sort of... Um, uh, so, so some of these ideas that we've had about how wonderful technology have, as always, um, the, the, the technology has moved faster than the sort of social change and the new ideas that we maybe need to adapt that technology to, uh, to our own environment. Um, at the same time that we know we can work from opposite ends of the world and talk to each other and see each other these days, um, we also need to simply get together to network, whether you do that formally or informally. That's clearly another factor to put into the mix. So this session is about how we can harness all the technology to the best effect. Um, and in the context of London itself, to look at the fact that London isn't actually like a dartboard with you know, the, the big values right at the center. Um, of course, you know, the center of London, the West End, the city, are traditionally and, and 
probably pretty much in perpetuity, the extremely expensive heart of, of tourism London, of the, of the city that uh, the people come to see from all over the world. But London's actually 660 square miles. It's got 33 boroughs. It's got areas like Croydon, Stratford emerging, Heathrow, uh, all of which are creating individual centres within the city. And the challenge, therefore, that some of us are looking at particularly in Transport for London, but also elsewhere, is how we actually optimise the new London, bearing in mind this enormous technology that we have at our disposal. So we've got three great speakers, um, the first of whom is Will McKee. Uh, Will's chairman of uh, the property uh, investment development group called Tilford Land. It's a rather unusual company in that it had its foundations in local authorities who wanted to take the business of land development seriously. He's a former chief executive of the British Property Federation. He's a very, very experienced local government person. He was chief executive of Merton. Uh, for some time, and um, uh, when Boris uh, arrived in City Hall, one of the things he asked Will to do was to chair a commission to look at outer London, not at the parks and palaces, but at the rest of those 660 square miles. They're recently reported, so uh, let's now, if we may, Will, listen to Will McKee. Well, thank you very much, Steve. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I did have a presentation which I may use. Uh, and I'm certainly going to talk around it rather than to it. 15 minutes isn't long. So I'm going to start off with the key messages because if I run out of time, it won't matter quite so much. Um, outer London is one of London's great underutilised resources in the view of the Commission. It is actually already one third of the GLA economy, Greater London Area Economy, uh, measured on GVA. That's equivalent to a half of the home counties combined, and it provides 40% already of London's jobs. And yet, until recently, successive plans for London have not ignored outer London, but they certainly haven't moved to utilise that potential. And one of the things that the current mayor wanted to do was to put that right. So he asked the uh, Commission to look at it. So London is, outer London in particular, is not only already very important <coughs> economically to London, to the country, but it's actually got an unrealised potential as well. The um, policy environment, which the, great, which the London plan, which is currently about to go into its EIP, is proposing, has never been more favourable to the development of outer London economically and in particular, that offers an opportunity to the creative industries. Why do I say that? Because the one thing that came out of the whole of the Commission work was not a prescriptive approach to outer London. And, for example, the Mayor asked us to look at the concepts of super hubs, and we ruled against super hubs simply because there wasn't enough growth to sustain the concept and there was a significant amount of nervousness amongst the rest of outer London that they may well miss out on what growth was to be had if it was concentrated into one or two um, super hub locations. And, and the policy that the Mayor has put to the inquiry is essentially one that says, outer London boroughs, you can determine your own economic future. Um, you have to justify it, of course, <coughs> and if you're relying upon Michelle's organisation to come in and give you infrastructure <coughs> reinforcement, well, you've got to make the case and there isn't much money around to do it, so don't be over-ambitious. So it's not an easy ride, but essentially it's saying if you, Croydon, want to get to be twice as big, if that's your ambition, then there's nothing in the London plan that's going to stop you, provided you can justify it. And if, on the other hand, you're, you're Sutton and you don't particularly want that to happen, then you don't have to have it forced on you. So there is a, 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 an atmosphere now in London planning policy which gives all of outer London the opportunity to identify its course ahead. Now, the thing that's been a problem, of course, is that compared with its competitors, Outer London has actually underperformed. Uh, I'll give you a few of the stats. Over the last two economic cycles, which is roughly 89 to 07, Outer London jobs have grown by about just under 3,000 per annum. Central London jobs have grown by just over 13,000 per annum. Inner London jobs have grown by over 5,000 per annum. And the outer metropolitan areas, the home counties around Outer London have grown by roughly 36,000 <coughs> jobs per annum. So, so Outer London has 